Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Courtside with Beelance and Sen as part of the Tennis Channel Podcast Network. I'm so fired up tonight because not only do I have my co-host and Hall of Famer Steve Flink with me on tonight, but we are also joined by one of our favorite commentators, Robbie Koenig. Robbie works for a host of TV channels around the world, covering most notably the Masters 1000 events, the Slams, as well as being the host of the premier online tennis channel of TennisTV.com. Robbie also competed on the Pro Tour, winning five doubles titles and reaching the semifinals of the 1998 U.S. Open doubles draw. It is an absolute privilege to welcome to the pod, Robbie Koenig. Robbie, thank you for spending time with us today. Boom on the intro, man. That's the best intro I've ever had, Dave. Thanks. Can I hire you as my agent, please? Yeah, yeah. I won't cost a lot either. So it's, it's, it's a good deal for you. I'd love to do it. No, thanks, man. No, it's always fun to be on the show. Of course, uh, uh, we knew to knowing each other. I've known Steve for um, so many years, and he has really been some somewhat of a mentor to me. And I absolutely love picking his brain. And uh, I've missed our chats over the last couple of uh, majors because I haven't been traveling due to COVID. So it's so nice to be able to connect with uh, uh, the legend that is Steve Flink. <laughs> Thank you, Robbie. We're Thank so you, excited to have you on. So let's talk, uh, I guess, you know, real, real briefly, current events. What have you, what, what's been going on with your front? Have you been starting to travel a little bit more or uh, what's going on on the, on the Koenig front? Yeah, not too much uh, this year, Dave. Uh, the only one I, I traveled for as far as the events are concerned was the French Open, which I did for Tennis Channel. But um, most of my work has been based in the UK with Amazon Prime and I've had to be based uh, for a fair chunk of the season here but South Africa came off the red list just a couple of weeks ago so I'm free to travel now back and forth to the UK for when I do the commentating here it's it's been a fun year man the fact that we still get to do this job the fact that tennis is still carried on has been fantastic and you know I'm in line for the last two events of the year namely being um, Paris Bercy which starts um, in a few days time and then of course the the season ending finale in Turin Fascinated to see how, how that all shakes out in Italy. And, you know, I can't think of a more apt place to have it, given the way Italian tennis has been performing of late. You know, we've got the next gen there. We've got the season ending finale there. Uh, so fingers crossed, um, you know, they can, they can live up to what London has given us over the last decade. No, 100%. Before we get back into more current events, I want to take you back a little bit and, and uh, have the listeners learn more about you. I know you're born in South Africa. Um, yep. I, I also know you do have uh, some family background, and I want to ask how you started, but your uncle played Davis Cup for South Africa, huh? Yeah, that's right. Um, uh, I come from uh, a big Catholic family, to say the least. Uh, television wasn't Prevalent in those days, Dave. Uh, my dad is one of 13. Um, and it's actually the baby uncle, uh, Guyton, who was a Davis Cup player. So Sunday afternoons, we used to go and play tennis at his house. Uh, all the adults used to play when I was a young nipper. You know, I'd be at the side of the court, just hanging over the fence, wanting to get a hit with him. And then maybe at the end of a Sunday afternoon, before we sat down and had some drinks and, and a barbecue or dinner, uh, Uncle Guy would give me you know, 10 minutes of his time and, and we'd have a hit. And the whole Sunday was based around those 10 or 15 minutes with him. So, you know, he was an early inspiration for me. Um, you know, that, that got the juices flowing. But I'm also the baby of four kids in our household. And my brother was a very good tennis player. He played at, at exactly the same time as Kevin Curran and was, you know, a top junior with Kevin back in the day. And then when Kevin went to Texas to university, uh, my brother wanted to follow him, my brother Carl. And my mom said, no, uh, you, you need to get a proper job. And he went to study law and became a very successful lawyer. Um, and actually was a decent squash player for a while, but um, never was able to pursue his tennis career. But he used to practice with me a lot. We used to play a lot together. And he was the one who, you know, used to, to kick my butt more often than not. And it was nice to have that older sibling uh, to push you all the time. And, uh, you know, big thanks to, to my older brother, who kind of missed out on his tennis career, but uh, you know he did everything for me to to get me along the path of being a, a half decent player. Steve, it's so interesting. You know, part of the best part about Steve and I doing these podcasts is just hearing the people's journeys and how they got started. And I mean, my God, your dad's one of thirteen. That's a race to the dinner table. I mean, <laughs> survival of the fittest, man. If you you know, if you're a, a little slow and 
you don't get your tea stuck in. Absolutely. Yeah. My, actually, my dad came from Mauritius, from the island of Mauritius. They were big sugarcane farmers there, and then they moved to South Africa and Durban in particular, because uh, along the Durban coastline, very tropical, big sugar industry, and um, uh, things were really progressing in South Africa at that time when they came over in the early '60s, and that's how the family ended up being uh, in South Africa. You know, it could be from Mauritius. I mean, that sounds very exotic. Um, <laughs> You mentioned your brother, you know, was a really good tennis player. He went to the, the law school route. Um, was turning pro always something that, that you had in your sights or um, was collegiate tennis something that you had considered as well? Collegiate tennis was something very much that I considered. I had two fantastic offers, one from the University of Miami where John Hamill, I don't know if you know that name, he was the head coach. He was South African, so that's how I got recruited. And the other guy was the head coach, and you guys will definitely know him well. Um, I'm having a brain cramp. Uh, Malibu, the school in Malibu. Alan Fox? Alan Absolutely. Fox. Um, yeah. Alan Fox at uh, Pepperdine. Pepperdine. Yes, right. And came out to South Africa to recruit both Kevin Elliott and myself. And I was leaning towards going to where the South African coach was in Miami. Knowing what I know now, Steve, uh, that would have been a bad decision because I love California so much, much more than I enjoy Miami. And of course we go there all the time because of the, the tournament that's there. Um, and knowing Alan, he would have been right up my alley. Uh, just the kind of coach oh, I would have loved to have played I, under. Well, I know I got to know Alan in the seventies. You two would have been a great match. You, you think a lot alike. And I, I think you would have enjoyed playing there he, he's uh yeah i've known him now for oh going back to 76 77 I, I used to go to the orange bowl and he'd be scouting out players there so <laughs> he he would have been a, an excellent match for you he just yeah, had a recent too. guest uh brad gilbert on and he's a huge fan of the pepper nine ways he played there for a couple of years so uh, yeah I, i'm just wondering if it would have been too nice for me dave um <laughs> seeing pictures of, the, of that campus and knowing what i know now man i might have got distracted there in california but actually when i finished high school and um uh, i think i did my military service i did one year of military service because i just wanted to get that out the way a lot of players uh, uh, of my ilk didn't do that they went straight to the states and if you were studying in the States, you could get away from the military service, but it was always in the back of the mind that if I came back one day and I had to do the military service, it would be you know, pain in the butt. So I did the one year. And at the end of that one year was when I was getting recruited by the colleges in the States. Um, and I was all set to go. I was all set to go, it looked like I was gonna go to Miami. And then for the first time ever, uh, Tennis South Africa increased their funding from the top four guys and they invested in another four players. And I was always one of those fringe players. When three guys traveled as juniors, I was ranked four. When four guys traveled as juniors, I seemed to be ranked number five. Uh, those guys were the likes of Wayne Ferreira, Grant Stafford, Marcus Andruska, and uh, Clinton Marsh was, a, was another guy who was one of the top players. So I always missed out on international tennis. So no funding. You know, easy decision for me to go to college. And then suddenly when the funding came in and I make the decision there to go pro um, rather than go to college in the States. And, and I look back at now and I, I was so green for those first couple of years <laughs> when I was playing futures and stuff in Europe and in the States. You know, guys came onto the court with, with new kit and six rackets. I was a set and a breakdown in my mind. They look so good. <laughs> you know, I, I had mismatched clothes you know, pro Kenex top, uh, I had some Wilson pants and different shoes. And, you know, I had the old Wilson rackets and the new ones. It was a, you know, mishmash. Uh, you felt well, you very figured it out quite, on... quite quickly, Ravi. I mean, you, you, you had some great success in, in doubles. Like I said in the intro, right? You won a few, you won a few titles, made the semis of the U.S. Open. Um, your success in doubles and picking partners and gelling with partners. Talk a little bit about um, how that occurred and, and, how your success um, was so beneficial to your pro career. Yeah, so, you know, I started out playing singles. My goal was always to try and make it as a singles player. And actually in 92, I had a decent year, qualified at a couple of tour events. Um, but my game style was serve and volley. Uh, served and volleyed a lot, always first serve, always looking to come in. 
but I never had a big enough serve to sustain a decent level to be a top 100 player. So when I was playing lights out, yeah, I could qualify tour events, win around here and there, but week in and week out, it just, it just wasn't big enough. And, you know, I banged on the door for six or seven years and it was, you know, it was actually a, a chance meeting with some tennis characters that you guys will know all too well at the U S open. I've just lost second round qualifying and, and I'm starting to contemplate my singles career now, you know, what do I do now? So I think, okay, let me just worry about trying to find a doubles partner to play qualies at the US Open in, in 97. And it's five minutes before signing. Craig Tiley, you know that name? Oh, yeah, from <laughs> Chicago. We know Craig very well. From old University of Illinois coach, now doing tennis Australia, obviously. Yeah, he's, um, he's standing in the foyer, uh, the old foyer at the US Open. Uh, he was coaching John Lafney de Jager at the time. John Lafney had just played Huggy Bear. He was coming back from injury. He had lost in his Huggy Bears match at that famous Pro-Am event um, in the Hamptons that was uh, bigger than some tour events for the players. And I'm looking for a partner and I see Craig standing there and I said, hey, Craig, you know, what's, what's JL up to? You know, would he like to play doubles qualifying with me at the US Open? He said, well, he didn't really want to play qualies. He wanted to try and find somebody to get in the main draw, but he hasn't found anybody. Let me tell him it's you. He gets on the phone, gets all of JL. And JL said, well, it's Robbie. Um, I'm in. But now he's in the Hamptons and, you know, we've got to play tomorrow if we get in. So anyway, I look at his ranking. I see my ranking. And Dave, we are beating the cut by one uh. spot. Anybody <laughs> knows how doubles entry works? One spot, both rankings combined. Whatever that number is, you've got to be ahead of, of the last guy. So... I knew the guys who were operating uh, the desk behind there and uh, had a quick look down at it. And I said, uh, how much time before uh, the sign in closes for doubles? And he looks at his watch and he goes, uh, uh, you know, five minutes. And I said, I'm going to come back with one minute to go just to check. Okay, I think I might have somebody. And I said it just to whoever was behind the desk at the time. And the reason I didn't want to sign in too early was I didn't want to give anybody else a chance to bump us out. Yeah. So literally, I hear uh, the supervisor say, last call for doubles. Everybody's looking around. I walk up to the piece of paper, and I sign Robbie Koenig, John Lafney de Yaga, and he pulls it off the desk. We get into qualies of the US Open. We sneak in. And in 97, we qualified, and we made the quarters. So in, in nine days, I'd made more money playing doves than I did the whole year trying to carve out a singles career for myself. And that was the tipping point in my career. And thereafter, it was, you know, full focus on dubs. And because I was a servant volleyer, I think, you know, my game translated very well to doubles. The fact that, you know, I only had to cover half the court. I couldn't be hurt as much on serve. And, um, you know, I still got to, to play the sport that I love so much. And now uh, the bonus was I got, I got to make a decent living out of it. Robbie, in those, days, in those days, though, did, did you envision yourself? I mean, here at, toward the end of your playing career, did you could you ever have envisioned where you would be today and that you would have made such an important contribution to the world of tennis broadcasting? Well, man, that's unbelievable that you say that. I, I can't believe those words when they come out of your mouth because... Now, I'm just this young kid from Durban, South Africa, the small little town um, who loves the game as much as every other tennis fan out there. And to, to enthuse people with the sport, to say they enjoy my commentary, my enthusiasm for the game, that's the greatest gift that I can give people. If, if I make them enjoy the tennis match more, I think, wow, then, then I'm doing a good job. But similarly, when they give me that compliment back, I think... a a lot of tennis fans and people like yourself, you don't understand how much that means to me. It's, um, it's the most fantastic feeling and it just validates that following my passion has been uh, the best decision I ever made in my life. How'd you get into it, Robbie? And like, did you have a mentor to, to help you along? Cause I mean, you're, you're doing all this unbelievable stuff. Like, like Steve asked that you didn't even envision it. Um, how did it all get, how did it all get going on the broadcasting side? Um, Unbelievable chance meeting with Jason Goodall. Of course, you guys know Jason well on the Tennis right. Channel and ESPN. 
and we worked together for many years, but uh, we lived two or three driveways down from each other in, in Wimbledon. And I'm walking to Southfields tube station one day and he must have, he must have been coming back and, and we meet on the corner of Bathgate Road, which is right by the All England Club. And we haven't seen each other in ages. Um, he was working on Tim Henman's um, website before that. We used to see each other on tour a little bit. And he stops me and, and, and we have a chat, you know, what are you doing, Robbie? I said, no, I'm coaching at the moment. This was in 2006, the year after I'd retired. I was working with Wesley Moody, South African and Mahesh uh, Bupati at the time. And I said, what are you doing, Jason? He goes, no, you know, I've been working with uh, ATP Media, the World Feed. Uh, ATP Media had just been formed. And he was commentating on the World Feed with John Barrett. And uh, Doug Adler was doing a little bit of work as well. And he's like, hey, would you ever be interested in getting into tennis commentating? I said, well, you know, I'm happy with my coaching right now. You know, I don't think so. He says, well, you know, they might be looking for somebody at the end of the year because John is turning 80, John Barrett, that is. And, you know, looking for an extra commentator next year. He says, by the way, you know, if you're ever at these tournaments when you're coaching at Indian Wells or Miami or Rome or Madrid, pop up. And, um, you know, we're always looking for additional help. There's only three of us. We're doing seven or eight matches a day. So pop up and we'll just talk tennis. So this happens, Dave. This happens. Uh, I get to finish one day early at Indian Wells. Uh, text him. He says, come up. Just come up. And we end up doing a couple of sets together. Um, and I'm just doing basic tennis analysis because that was always my strength. I think I always analyzed the game well because I had no weapons myself. Uh, <laughs> You know, need must sort of thing. And, you know, it happened in Rome, did a couple of sets there. And by the time we get to Cincinnati, um, Wesley Moody has said to me that he doesn't want to work with me anymore. That happens after Wimbledon. And suddenly I realize how, you know, finicky the world of tennis coaching can be. And, you know, one day you're hot, next day you're not. And then you're on this merry-go-round. Is somebody going to hire you? Is somebody not going to hire you? And um, I do a, a match in Cincy and the head of production at that time, shame, uh, God bless his soul, uh, Steve Plaster, who passed away so tragically, so young. And uh, Steve calls me and he says, Robbie, listen, we really like your work. Would you be interested in commentating next year? John Barrett's retiring. And, you know, we love what you bring to the party. And I said, you know, given what would happen, I just lost half a player in the coaching setup, I thought, you know, whatever, this is great security, get to travel to all the biggest tournaments and get to talk tennis, man. I mean, there's a lot worse jobs out there, Robbie. There's a lot worse oh, jobs is. out there. And I'll tell you what, I, I appreciate it every day. And if it wasn't for that chance meeting with Jason and him, him encouraging me. Um, and, you know, for the first 10 years that we were together, he was on my case, man. Jason's got high standards and, Whenever we get tired after long days, he's like, come on, Rob, you got to up your game. Getting a little tired there. The first, the first six hours was good. but <laughs> And Jason's been fantastic like that. From day one, he always held me to a higher level. So um, so grateful for, for him for doing that to me. And, and, you know, we became a good partnership. Um, and I always say, I think, you know, commentating is so much about the team effort. And I think the more you commentate with somebody, the more you – improve your rapport with them and that's why i'm a big fan of commentating teams yeah. um, uh, david let me, let me just say something about robbie what stood out to me and i'm sure to you too david is that he has this unbridled enthusiasm for the game and so what he does in the booth is he brings across that enthusiasm with deep knowledge it's an irresistible combination. And I, what I would like to know, Robbie, is how the development of that. For instance, you, you mentioned Jason, and Jason is a first-rate commentator. He has his own distinctive style, too. He also has a lot of, uh, he's very effusive. But there's something about the way you go about it. There's, a, there's a, a fan living inside you that is conveying his knowledge, that's putting himself in the living room of those viewers and saying, you know, I'm, I'm kind of like you. I want to share, I want to reach out to you. I could be sitting right where you are right now, but I'm lucky enough to be here in the booth. So let's let's talk about it. And how did that come about, Robbie? Because it really sets you apart. I want to add one more thing, David, before he answers. 
I was interviewing Martina Navratilova seven years ago for a piece. She was talking about her commentary. And as you know, she's a first rate commentator herself for the Tennis Channel and very insightful, one of the best former great players to do that job. And she just said very matter of factly, well, when I'm watching tennis, I'll tell you the guy that I really like, and it's Robbie Koenig, because every time he says something, he, se he seems to be saying exactly what I'm thinking, which I thought was a, a, a well-deserved compliment. So I just want to give that as a bit of background. But Robbie, sorry for being so long-winded. Talk about how you developed your style and how you managed to bring to bring across that sort of fans approach to it, but still be as professional as you clearly are. Steve, I think a lot of a lot of inspiration actually came from watching um, American sports and particularly basketball. And when I first started going to the States, the way the basketball commentators uh, showed their enthusiasm for particular players and teams really resonated with me. And this was before I actually started commentating myself. And I thought, man, that, that really draws me in. I would say to a large degree as well, the football commentary that you hear in the UK, very articulate commentators, but they've, the good ones have got this ability to to draw you on with excitement in their voices. And, and again, that's naturally my personality. Those, those people who know me outside of my tennis environment, what you, what you hear on the broadcast is, is kind of what you get from me in, in everyday life. And I think certainly those were big influences on me. Um, a certain, as, as far as coming up with one-liners and developing that side of my commentary, that was a result of listening back to myself and trying to, to get better, especially when you listen to highlight reels. Um, and I realized I was describing great points the same way all the time. And you only get that when you listen to highlight reels, because over the course of a match, you forgot what you said 15 minutes ago. And sometimes you use the same adjectives. But as, as sports broadcasting evolved and these highlights packages became more and more common, I realized I had to find a way to describe the same winner, you know, 15 or 20 different ways. Because if those highlights got played back, which, you know, often is the case for a lot of tennis fans, they don't have the time to watch an entire match. Um, I had to get better in that department. So it was literally a case of sometimes going to the, to the thesaurus and having a look at a word like unbelievable. You know, and replicating that or phenomenal and then replicating that. Um, so that's how, how that kind of unfolded. And then you start making notes. And yeah, I do make notes about commentary and words that I would like to use in commentary. But for me, the skill is to try and not make that sound as if it's scripted. And I think with time and practice, you get better and better at not only remembering what you've written down, but then in the delivery, making it exciting, making it sound like it's off the cuff. And um, again, learning from other commentators and other sports where, where guys deliver a line that's pertinent to their sport. And I think, geez, that's unbelievable. How can I you know, tweak that and make it tennis relevant? So borrow from them and learn from them, learn from writers. They, who, who describe a player in a certain way and you think that's incredible you know I can tweak that a bit and and use it and give credit to the, the person that I got it from and you know hopefully speak about and sports repetitive by nature so that's the tricky part well I'm sure you got uh, the guy on my uh, upper left on the screen that I'm looking at I'm sure you looked at some of his uh, writings and can learn from him I'm sure right Oh, absolutely. I mean, Steve knows all too well how many conversations we have. I love it when we just sneak onto an outside court and, you know, he just talks about matches at the US Open, you know, 15, 20, 30 years ago. And, you know, I love how articulate Steve is, the way he, he writes this stuff. I mean, we've had hundreds of conversations. Um, and Steve is very different to a lot of the other Americans. He doesn't speak as fast as them. I love the way he delivers stuff. Uh, yeah, I'm a huge fan, eh, Stevie? You know that. Uh, you're very kind, Robbie, and I appreciate that. But what I would like to know, which of the tennis commentators, you, you mentioned basketball, uh, but how about 
as you were, you know, in your playing days or as your broad broadcasting career was starting, in addition to Jason, who you say was obviously a very helpful to you in, in developing, yeah. were there some of the more renowned commentators that, that had a deep impact on you? You know, we didn't get much tennis growing up back in South Africa. You were lucky if you got the Wimbledon semis and finals. Um, and again, you know, John Barrett would have been one of the voices that I heard on a, a regular basis. So when I got to meet JB for the first time, it's it's quite surreal. You know, as a youngster, you've just heard his voice for years on Wimbledon finals with Dan Maskell. Uh, and at the US Open, obviously, uh, back in the early days, when I was growing up in the 80s, Cliffy Drysdale, who was South African, that was the South African connection. We used to, used to hear Cliffy back at home um, on, on the US Open feed that we used to get. But it, again, you know, probably only a handful of matches during a US Open or Wimbledon. And, and the other majors weren't broadcast that much. So those guys in particular were the voices that I had in my head from, from my early days. Funny, Robbie, because... John, I, I wanted to mention this as you were alluding to John earlier, but when I was growing up, I spent a lot of time at Queens Club. My father lived over in London. I'd spend summers with him. I eventually lived over there for three years, yeah. started, college, started college over there. And John was a, Bud Collins was my big mentor on, on uh, the other side of the Atlantic, back home in the States. But John had a, was, was very helpful to me. And then when I went, when I transferred to Stetson University in Florida and I was already grooming myself to be a reporter, John would allow me to, if I wanted to fly off to the Masters in Boston or the US Pro Indoor in Philadelphia, he would always say, yeah, you can room with me. He'd know that I was paying my own money to come to the site. So he would say, don't worry about it. I've got to, you can stay with me in the hotel and just, just a great guy. And also always offering constructive criticism. And then I had the great joy of presenting him at the Hall of Fame when he went in in 2014 he asked me to speak for him and uh, that that was a great pleasure so we have John Barrett in co in, in common along with so many other things but but I also want to add David quickly that Robbie alluded to the discussions the two of us have had and and it's it's true at all the majors Robbie will come around to my desk during Wimbledon or we've sat together over in Armstrong at the US Open and had great conversations during the Australian Open and I I like to believe, I think we've learned a lot from each other. I had the photographic memory, yes, to be able to pull out all these details and tell Robbie about matches, but then I always gleaned a lot from his insights. This was a two-way street and don't think any differently than that. Hey man, well, well, hopefully one day soon, I could be a fly on that wall between the two of you. <laughs> that would be, uh, that would definitely be a highlight for me. So, so good. Thank you both for sharing. Uh, those experiences. I want to bring you back a little bit now to more um, common day. And Robbie, you mentioned something recently on social media and Steve and I had talked about it and it was mm -hmm. such a good point. And, you know, when you looked at this past U.S. Open, you didn't have two of the three of the big three weren't there, right? Roger and Rafa were injured. You, had, you did have Novak. We're going to get to Novak in a minute. But there was so much talk there. There still is so much talk. Is tennis going to be okay without the big three? And I think the U S open, and again, Steve and I have talked about this, the U S open showed, especially that first week was unbelievable that this sport is going to be just fine without the big three. And you mentioned something on social media recently. And you said a lot of the quality of tennis depends on the other, on the person on the other side of the net. And by, what, what I believe you meant, and I'm going to ask you to kind of describe it a little bit is, Let's just say Francis TFO was playing Roger Federer. Roger wins a routine 6-2-6-2. Roger may not have allowed Francis to showcase his athleticism and his amazing shot making. Now, if you have Francis, let's play, uh, let's say he's playing the match that we were referring to early, Yannick Sinner, right? Now you're seeing two guys, incredible athleticism, incredible shot making. That's something that you may not have seen when Francis plays fed, but when Francis plays someone a little bit outside that top three, you see the quality of the tennis and it's amazing. And this sport will definitely be okay after the big three leave. Yes. Yeah. I think I said something to the effect that level is always relative to the opponent on the other side of the net. Yes. And I mean, how good was the US Open? How many great matches, five set matches, matches that were, you know, guys having set points, match points, not getting it done. The margins are so fun. And I think even those 
in the tennis world will know that the difference between the big three and, and even in the chasing pack, it's, you know, I think the difference uh, I saw Minister. on a set, 53%, they win 53% of the points. Um, everybody else wins 47 of the points. Normally it's 49, 51 for the chasing pack. So that difference is minuscule. But and it's exactly that. You can see so much great tennis. You can see incredible athleticism. If guys are evenly matched, I think the match we're talking about was the match in Vienna. And what a competition it was. It was entertaining. It was athletic. You know, you had a bit of everything there. And, you know, in time, these guys are going to contest the latest stages and majors. And I think by default, they will become the new big names in tennis because Novak will retire, Roger will retire, Rafa will retire, and these guys will be front and center. They will be written about, you know, in, in the headlines in the New York Times or the Chicago Times or the Sunday Tribune where I live. And, and they will become great because they will be the next major winners. So I think it's very important to keep that in mind. I think what we're seeing now, you know, from eight in the world, maybe even a little bit lower than that, five in the world to a hundred in the world. Incredible. You know, we're going to see some incredible matches. Jensen Brooksby, man. I mean, how good was he at the US Open? And, and this is a guy who came in, you know, ranked just outside the top hundred. Look how well he's done. So uh, I think that matchup is so important. Um, yes, we've seen a generation with these guys, uh, the top three guys in the world that has just been unparalleled. And, you know, how great it's been for us guys, right? To, oh, to be amazing. Part of that Steve, history. you got anything to add on this one? No. <laughs> I mean, it, you both have said it so eloquently. No, I totally, but I totally agree with Robbie's uh, chief points here. And yours too, Dave, because I know how much you agree with that. And we've discussed it informally and formally. And I just believe that uh, yeah, it is it is a lot, the, the matchup. And, and sometimes we can have a little bit of a letdown, Robbie. Sometimes neither player plays up to par. That's sports. But I would also add, I think the great thing about tennis, Robbie, and getting back to your basketball uh, observations, is that you cannot run out that clock. And it is mm -hmm. such a cruel sport. In the, in, and you see someone like Sinner, who seems to be toying with Tiafo, and he's up a set in 5-2. And the next thing you know, he's, lo he's lost that match 6-2 in the third. And not because he totally collapsed either. He, he definitely tightened up. But the point is, he couldn't. You would never have believed it at a set in five two that it was even possible. And, and yet we see this in tennis all the time, Robbie. You alluded to all the great U.S. Open matches and the twist and turn. And to me, my question to you, Robbie, would be, don't you think those that the, the originators of the scoring system were brilliant? To me, the only change we've had really in that scoring system is the tiebreaker. And the tiebreaker was crucial for television, and I think, for, the, for just for the sport in general to have an ending point in a given set and not let it go to 24, 22 or 36, 34. But aside from that, the original scoring system to me is held up beautifully and it always enables the loser to retain hope and have that opportunity to come back. Can you talk about that aspect of the sport? Oh, I mean, you know, I've often said in commentary, I don't know if the inventors of the scoring system in tennis are absolute geniuses or the devils in disguise. <laughs> because it, it is a thing of beauty and you know on on the wta uh, website they have got a section called great escapes it's it's a brilliant addition to their website and they're tracking the number of matches where a player has saved uh you know saved match points and gone on to win and i think already this season we're on about 56 or 57 oh. But that gives you an indication of how small the margins are. And of course, the one that springs to mind, as far as the women are concerned, start of the year, you know, Muguruza, two match points against Osaka to put her out of the tournament. Uh, right. A couple of matches later, she's a champion holding up the trophy. Uh, right, right. Unbelievable. Hey, I want to get your thoughts on, uh, on Novak and anything that, um, you know, obviously a remarkable year and obviously 27 of 27 and, He's there. It's his final match. He's got one more to go. Um, was there something specific that you saw on that Sunday that that maybe felt for you pretty shortly into that Sunday final that this may th this might be a little bit different here? 
Yeah, I think seven games in, um, you could see that he was half a step slow. The accumulation of the matches that he'd played, I think the physical and mental energy that he had um, expended against Zverev, the quality of that match was insane. And, you know, it, it had been a long time that I could think of where, when Novak had lost a first set and had to work so hard to get to the final stages. And this is where the top three have been so good, Dave, is that they don't expend a lot of energy getting to the latter stages of a major, but it was the first time in a while that Novak had done that. And I think it was, it was the culmination of everything, losing sets in, in matches, having to put in so much effort, the semi-final being as difficult as it was, coupled with that burden of expectation I don't think any of us mere, mere mortals can even begin to comprehend what that must have been like for him, knowing that, you know, history is right there at his fingertips, one match away from it. But, you know, he would have woken up on Sunday morning knowing that his legs were not as fresh as they have been in other major finals. And only he and his, you know, uh, close ones would have known that. And, and he would have known that the how, how big of a, a task it was and I think we saw that all unfold in the third set tall over his head and it was fascinating because the first time he rubbed his head and I saw him crying I said it in my head he's crying I couldn't believe it I couldn't believe that the outpouring of the emotions happened and the commentators didn't pick it up and I was just watching him every time he was rubbing his face you could see it wasn't normal and then finally when he lifted his towel off you could see that he had been crying under the towel and I think that then told us all exactly what he had been feeling and I guess that had been a build-up since Wimbledon once he won Wimbledon we knew it was all on so that was a you know two-month period where um, you know he's supposed to be bringing a documentary at the end of the year it'll be fascinating to hear what he has to say about that period uh, in his life and give us some some real insights as to what he was going through. Robbie, you sized that up beautifully I, I and, and David and I have discussed that match obviously with various people and everybody weighs in has their own take on it but i think he uh i think the the irony to me was i have never seen a crowd more ready to cheer him on as that u.s open crowd from this moment he walked on the court the thundering ovation he got walking out on the court and this if if we had seen a fresher novak a joke of it's closer to the height of his powers with that kind of a crowd behind him it would i, I can only imagine what that could have done Usually he has to always overcome crowds that are not necessarily antagonistic, but not supportive. They, 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 they're more on Roger's side or Rafa's or, or just for the underdogs that Novak competes against. So I thought that was another interesting that, uh, aspect, but I thought you, I thought you, uh, you summed this up to perfection. Yeah, you know, I think from a selfish point of view, um, I would have loved to see him do it. I would love to be around and be part of a generation and so betting right. on matches where this has happened. I wasn't alive when when Labour did it. So, uh, well, I was Robbie. I, I that's and it's funny because you're echoing my own feelings. Is that I remember I, I was talking to Chris Clary of the New York Times before the tournament. He interviewed me and we were talking about all the other Grand Slams. Mm -hmm. And I was there for Labour. I saw the last two legs. I saw almost every match he played at Wimbledon. I was a 17 year old. Yeah. And was back at, in New York for the U.S. Open and, and saw him beat Tony Roach in the finals of the Open, saw most of his matches there as well. And I really, I, I wanted it for the same reasons you did. I thought it would have been great for tennis. I also thought Djokovic would have been very worthy of the achievement because he put himself on the line. He never hid the fact that this would, he, as soon as he won Roland Garros, he, he made it very clear he was going after this, that he wanted this. And, and I thought that was... That was that was commendable. So, uh, but I felt like you did because I thought to myself, there I was, 52 years ago, watching Labor do it. I'm probably never going to get another chance in my lifetime, and and I, I, that for that reason, I hoped it would happen. Yeah, well said. Couldn't yeah, agree with I think more. we all agree, we all agree with that one. All right, two more for you, Robbie. One one pretty quick one, and then the others. Steve and I are going to kind of take what you give and go into a future episode and talk with what you give. So real quickly, um, you and Steve both have traveled the world so many times, covered so many events, favorite Sam, favorite slam to play favorite slam to cover. Uh, Wimbledon for me, um, 
just edges out the rest. Uh, I had my most success at the US Open. I absolutely love that place, but just the uniqueness of Wimbledon. Um, to commentate that, I'll tell you what, it's so tight. Uh, probably I, I'm going to give Australia the nod there because there's so many great courses, golf courses in Melbourne. And then if I have a late start to the day, Dave, I sneak out and I hit, you know, Kingston Heath or um, or Royal Melbourne for a, for a game of golf before I go and get to commentate on the very best tennis players in the world. So that environment with the coffees culture that you have in Melbourne, it's everybody's so relaxed. It's, it's just a super, super event. And Mr. I think Steve echoes your, I think we, when we asked Steve, he said the same thing, Wimbledon followed by Australia. Steve loves Australia. I couldn't believe Robbie. I just can't believe how (laughs) that Australian is. And I I got there in 16 and 17, having never had the opportunity before, despite my over 50 Wimbledons and every French from 82 through 2019. But for a variety of reasons, I had never gone to the Australian and I, I, it lived up more than lived up to his billing, Robbie. And you saw, you, you kind of got to it there. The so-called happy slam is exactly what it is. Yep. All right, last one for you. And depending on when we release this, Robbie, Steve and I are going to have a discussion on uh, the fall tennis season. So here's the question for you. Do okay. you think there should be Masters 1,000 events in the fall season? Hmm. Tough question. We got him silent, Steve. <laughs> well, um, obviously we have Paris, Bercy. We sh- we normally have Shanghai. Have I, have I got the, the timeline right? Full yeah. season. It's usually it's two in post, the fall. It's post-US Open. Should we have them? I mean, if we don't have them, the upside for players is that there's no mandatory... Um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? You, you're not forced to Mandatory requirements. Requirements, yeah. absolutely. Thanks, Dave. So you could shut down the season a little earlier if you wanted and allow your time, yourself and your body more time to recover. So that would be, you know, a big upside of doing it. Personally, Paris Bercy for me is the worst of the Masters 1000s. You have a fantastic center court, but I think the other courts are very subpar when you compare to what we get at uh, the other eight Masters 1000s. Um, I think it's it's important for us to have a Masters 1000 in uh, the Chinese uh, China region. So perhaps bringing that a little closer or sneaking it in somewhere else in the season, maybe earlier on in the season, I think that is important. But I absolutely wouldn't be against uh, not having one after the US Open. Okay. I, I, cause I have thoughts on this. I'm not going to go into it right now. Um, Steve knows some of my thoughts on it. I don't know Steve's thoughts on it, which is good because it'll yeah. make for an interesting episode. Um, we're going to use some of that. We're going to use some okay, of that. Quickly, Robbie. you can't say that. You've got to give me a, do you want them in the fall season? Yes or no, David? I do not want, I do not think there should be any masters 1000s after the U S open strongly. Steve, against thank- we want to know your answer to the same question, please. Well, I'm almost always on the same side of the net as David, who's not going to listen. I do believe we need them. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Interesting. Interesting. Robbie, this was uh, this was amazing. When we were talking about, can we try to get him on, try to get him on, I said, hey, man, I could listen to Robbie Koenig speak for days. So uh, thank you for taking time out of your day. Thank you so much for, for, for talking with us. This was a blast. This was an absolute hey. blast. Love you guys, man. Thanks so much for having me on the show.